Okay. Sorry. Come on. Okay. So um, at this point in Art History 1, you should have already watched the lectures for uh, the Paleolithic period and then the two lectures for the Neolithic period, right? And so now we're getting into new topics. We're going to talk about ancient Egypt and the Kingdom of Kush. So again, I'm going to split up this lecture so that it's in smaller chunks for you uh, to listen to. Um, for those of you who are taking this online and for those of you in my seated class who are using this as review, you may remember that because of the length of our class, I cut this up uh, in the seated class as well. So it should be pretty familiar information. Okay, so what we're going to do today um, and in the next lecture is talk about some general information about Egypt and also um, Nubia or ancient Sudan. We're going to look at the pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods in Egypt. We're going to look at the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom, the Akhenaten and uh, Amarna periods in Egypt, and then we're going to look at the Kingdom of Kush kind of as an overview because it relates pretty directly to what's going on in Egypt and tends to get left out of the discussion when we talk about Egypt. Um, it, it, a lot of art history um, prior to this, and, and this includes when I was in school and when I took this class, looks at Egypt in a way that's very Eurocentric. It's sort of Egypt and Egypt's relations with the Mediterranean, with the, uh, the particularly the Romans, um, and doesn't look at Egypt where it is as a part of Africa and its relationships to the south and to the west. Um, so I like to, to put it in a little bit different of a lens where we're also looking at the Kingdom of Kush, which is very integrated in the history of Egypt. So, so we're gonna spend some time with that in the, the part two of this lecture, basically. Um, so in a seated class, what I tend to do is start off this lecture, like I do most of them, by saying, what do you know about this topic? And with Egypt, it's one of the ones that people tend to know quite a few things because Egypt has become such an integral part of popular culture and has been for a long time. Um, in the 1800s, when people, archaeologists and people started really, um, discovering, discovering and unearthing all of these important finds in Egypt, it became very popular. It became this very uh, interesting sort of faster fascination in the West and, and so in Europe uh, and later in America. So um, we have seen this uh, infiltration of Egyptian sort of tropes um, and, and uh, iconography in popular culture for a long time, right? For, for pretty much all of the 20th century and still in, in current times as well. So I like to start off by asking people what they know about Egypt or what comes to mind when they hear Egypt, particularly ancient Egypt, and, and just kind of make a collection on the board of what, what, people, what people's knowledge base and what their assumptions are. So first we're gonna talk about some important things to just sort of set up the culture in which these artifacts and buildings and monuments were created. So one of the most important things in this culture is life after death. So basically glorifying the gods that, ex that exist as part of this uh, culture is an important part of life for the ancient Egyptians so that you'll have a good afterlife. So it's sort of putting in your time and your worship glorifying the gods so that they will take care of you in the afterlife. Um, kings, who are, are called pharaohs, right, in, in ancient Egypt, are also seen as divine. So, so a little kind of a strange concept, I think, for, for us particularly, those of us that are Americans, we don't have kings, right? Um, and we certainly don't have kings that we think are appointed by God. That's, that's not really a part of our culture. So it's sort of a strange concept. But um, we saw this when we were looking at some of the civilizations in the Fertile Crescent, right? Remember in Sumer, all the city-states of Sumer, where each city-state had a ruler, and that ruler was associated with a different deity and was appointed to rule by that deity. So some similar cultural things that we've already been talking about. So um, 
basically the pharaohs are kind of intermediaries between the people they're ruling and the gods above. And it's thought that they have a direct line of communication with the gods. So that's an important piece to, to keep in mind. Um, another important aspect is ka, K-A. So ka is the word for life force in ancient Egyptian. Um, it's similar to the Western concept of a soul. Okay, so the ka is like the, the essence, the life force of the person. Um, it exists forever, so even when the body dies, the ka is eternal, the ka goes on forever, um, and it's something that um, ancient Egyptians wanted to provide comfort for in the afterlife. So they know that their, their ka, their soul, is going to live on after their body is dead, and they want to make sure that it, it has things in the afterlife to make it comfortable and make it have a good afterlife, okay? Which is also a little bit of a strange kind of concept, I think, for a lot of us with a, a, a westernized upbringing. Um, so many artifacts, when a lot of, the, one of the things that a lot of people uh, mention on the first day when I say, what do you know about Egypt? A lot of people talk about the tombs with the gold sarcophagus and all of the sort of treasures in the tombs of, of the pharaohs. And the reason that these artifacts are buried with these, um, these ancient Egyptians is because those are for their ka, their essence, their soul, in the next life. So the idea is that if you bury these things with the body, the, um, some version of them is then translated into the afterlife for uh, your, your soul. Um, and so many artifacts, including uh, papyrus scrolls, have been found in these tombs that have been discovered by archaeologists over the years. And one of the things that's um, really important about this is it preserved this practice of putting all these artifacts, including scrolls with lots of writing on them, in these tombs and sealing them up. It preserved all of those things for thousands and thousands of years. So when they were discovered, they're in really good condition because they were sealed off from everyone. You're not supposed to go into the tomb after the tomb has been sealed. And, and so we have these sort of pristine um, archives, basically, of these important ancient Egyptians. And what was important to them was preserved so that it would go on to the next life. So we have these scrolls, we have all these artifacts that were important in daily use. So we have a lot of information. Um, one of these scrolls that is important and has been found uh, in a tomb is the, uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So this was found in the tomb of uh, Hunifer, H-U-N-E-F-E-R. Uh, -E -E I have it on the slide there, Hunifer. So this was found in his tomb, and Hunifer was a scribe. So what do we know about scribes? A scribe is someone who writes things down, and in ancient Egypt, this is a pretty important role. This is kind of the record keeper. So all of the higher ups in within the, the, the kingdom, within the government, um, had scribes and it was a, a kind of a prestigious role. And this particular scribe um, was the scribe for Seti the first, uh, S-E-T-I-1. And so he um, had some, he was kind of a higher up. So he has a, a, a nice burial area, a nice tomb that has all his artifacts, and he has all these scrolls, and one of the scrolls that he has is the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And the Egyptian Book of the Dead is something that gave archaeologists and art historians and historians a lot of information about Egyptian culture and their practices, and also gave us a lot of um, hieroglyphics, which is their writing form, similar to pictographs, which we talked about last time. Um, and so it's a very important document historically. And what actually is it? Well, it's a collection of spells and prayers um, that are needed to secure a happy afterlife. So it's kind of the recipe book for how to make sure your ka is taken care of in the next life and goes to, to the good place, to the place you want your soul to go. Um, and it also describes many of the important Egyptian deities, because remember, we said on the last slide that one of the uh, important things to get to the good afterlife is glorifying the gods and the deities in your um, life on earth, right? So it makes sense that this book that's sort of the instruction manual, manual to get your good afterlife talks a lot about the important Egyptian deities. 
It talks about the Ka quite a lot and its importance. It also talks about the specific steps in the transition to the afterlife, which is pretty interesting. So to better uh, understand Egyptian culture and some of the artifacts and images we're going to look at and kind of re filter some of the information you already have from popular culture about Egypt, let's just look at some of the gods and goddesses that are frequently depicted and kind of find out a little bit about them, just so we have sort of a who's who of, of this Egyptian book of the dead and, and a lot of the hieroglyphics and things that we see. Um, so we have Anubis. Anubis has uh, the head of a jackal, which is a kind of a dog, basically. It's a, it's like, it looks sort of like a black German shepherd, maybe not quite as fluffy. Um, and so Anubis is the god of death, okay? And we see Anubis in a lot of popular culture things. We also see the, the word or the name Anubis used sort of cleverly in a lot of places. Um, I, if you read Neil Gaiman's American Gods, or I think it's now a television show, Anubis is a character in that. If you um, liked the uh, True Blood show or the Sookie Stackhouse novels, the airline that transports... Uh, Vampires is called Anubis Air because the god of death, blah, blah, blah. So you see Anubis in a lot of popular culture. Um, then we have Mat. So uh, Mat is the goddess of truth and justice. Sometimes she is portrayed as just a feather. Sometimes she is portrayed like this where she has wings, which is a little confu confusing because she looks very much like um, her sister Isis, who we will talk about in a minute. But um, oftentimes she's just shown as a feather with scales, with not scales like a lizard, scales like uh, to weigh things, like the scales of justice. Okay. And uh, then we have Amit, who is this, is kind of my favorite. He's this very strange looking um, kind of chimera-like creature. Um, so he is a made up of crocodile, lion, and hippopotamus parts. Sometimes he also has spots like a leopard, like he is shown here. And so he devours the sinful. So when you're in getting into the afterlife, an Anubis is kind of assessing you, and then Mott weighs your soul on, on her scales. And if you are found after the weighing and the assessing to be bad and sinful and not have done a good job in your actual life, you get thrown to a mat and the mat eats you. Okay, so end of the road for you, you get eaten by this crocodile, lion, hippo creature. Um, Toth is uh, this god that has this uh, head of an ibis. An ibis is kind of like, um, anyone who's from here, you know probably what a, a heron is, a great blue heron. You see them in creeks and lakes around here a lot sort of stork-like thing. So an ibis is kind of like that. It's white and it has sort of a long beak and then it has long legs. Um, so that's an ibis. So Toth has the head of an ibis and he's the one, he's the scribe of the gods. So he's the one who writes everything down and records the good and bad deeds of you in your mortal life and, and keeps track of everything. He's also um, the uh, god of humor. So he's kind of an interesting character. He's also in charge of proceedings. So, so he and uh, Mott both kind of deal with things like justice and proceedings and order and, and things like that. Uh, then we have uh, Osiris. Osiris is often portrayed having a green face, like you see here. And Osiris is also the god of the dead, like Anubis. He kind of shares that. But he's also the god uh, affiliated with dead kings, dead pharaohs specifically. And he's a god who represents order. So he's very important in sort of the order and justice department as well. Um, and then we have... Uh, Horus, who has a falcon head, so he has a head of a falcon, a falcon is kind of like an eagle, you know, um, and he is the son of Osiris, and he is the god who is associated with the living kings, the living pharaohs. So when you're alive, the, the guy you're aligned with is Horus. When you die and you're the king, the god you're aligned with is Osiris. Horus has the falcon head. Sometimes he's just portrayed as a falcon, like as a whole body falcon. And he often has this round kind of sun disc around uh, above his head like this as well. Okay, then we have Isis and Horus. Um, so, oh, not Horus, Hathor. Sorry, that's a typo. 
pretend that does not say Horus. That's supposed to say Hathor. Apologies. Um, so Isis, she is uh, often shown having wings, which is why she's kind of uh, easy to confuse with Mott. Um, sometimes she doesn't have wings and she's just standing and is sort of identified by who she's standing with. Uh, she is Osiris's sister. Their other sister is Nephthys, and they are often shown together. So if you see two goddesses standing together, oftentimes that's Isis and Nephthys. Nephthys is N-E-P-H-T-H-Y-S. This is supposed to say Hathor, not Horus. We already talked about Horus. He's the falcon-headed guy. Hathor, H-A-T-H-O-R, is the mother goddess. And she is... <laughs> Unfortunately, because I think a lot of women would not like this, she is always she's portrayed as a cow. So <laughs> this is a, a a cow, and that is uh, Hathor. Sometimes she just has the head of a cow, um, and sometimes she is a woman. But uh, if you see depictions of a cow, particularly with the sun disc and the sort of uh, ornamental headpiece on, that is Hathor. She is the mother goddess, and is affiliated with childbirth and uh, queens and things like that. Um, we have a lot of other gods. Uh, there's Nephthys, um, who, like I said, is, is one of Osiris and Iris, Isis's sisters. We have Seth, who's the god of uh, chaos. We have Shu, who represents uh, maleness, the male uh, sex. Um, we have Tefnut, who is kind of the female equivalent of Shu. She represents the uh, female uh, gender and, and sex. We have Nut, who is the god of the sky. We have Amen, who's also called Ray. That's the god of the sun. That's the creator god. And we have Khonshu, who is the god of the moon. Okay, so here are some other gods that appear, uh, but they're a little harder to depict. The ones that I just showed you have sort of distinguished um, attributes or characteristics that are easy to pick out. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to look at is the pre-dynastic and early dynastic period. So dynasty might be a word that's familiar to you. Um, your parents, or gosh, at this point, probably your grandparents may have liked the show Dynasty back in the day. It was a soap opera. That's not what we're talking about. Um, you may be familiar with dynasties when talking about uh, China. Um, China's history is organized in dynasties as well. So uh, Egypt's is too. And uh, so pre-dynastic means kind of early, early days in, in Egypt before um, it gets organized into these dynasties. And then the early dynastic is the beginning of dynasties. All that means, all the word dynastic means, is that periods of time are organized by the uh, leader or the family, the pharaoh and the family of the pharaohs that govern because it's, it's inherited. So once the pharaoh dies, his son takes over or some relative of his takes over. So they're all in one grouping, one dynasty. Okay. So here is the first artifact we are going to look at. And this is the palette of King Narmir. Um, this is pretty cool. Uh, you can see this. I saw this at the British Museum uh, in London. It's a pretty interesting thing. So it was found in Hirakana here at Canopolis, sorry, uh, Egypt. It's from around 3000 to 2920 BC, and it is carved out of slate. Slate is a kind of metamorphic rock, okay, with lots of slate in the, in the Ozarks. Uh, people use it for interior design. You have a lot of slate tile and things like that. Uh, it tends to be this dark kind of gray color. Okay, so who is Narmir? Uh, Narmir is a very important pharaoh, a very important king in Egypt, in that he's the one who unified Upper and Lower Egypt. The thing about Upper and Lower Egypt is they're backwards from what you'd think. So, very important river that runs through Egypt, the Nile. You've maybe heard of the Nile. Um, so it is uh, one of the longest, I think actually it might be the longest river in the world. So, at the top of Egypt, it has the Nile Delta, which kind of blooms out. It looks sort of like if we were in the seated class, I'd be drawing a picture of it on the board right now. So it makes this kind of fan-like shape. It's called a Delta. And uh, that flows into the Mediterranean. Um, and then it has this long uh, path where it goes through the rest of Egypt. So you would think that Upper Egypt would be up at the top of the map toward the Mediterranean, toward Europe, and Lower Egypt would be at the bottom of the map toward Sudan, toward the rest of Africa. It's the opposite of that. So it refers to um, upriver or downriver, okay, upstream or downstream. So um, 
upper Egypt is the lower half of Egypt and lower Egypt is what we see on the map as the upper half of Egypt. So basically where the river goes into a delta and goes into the Mediterranean, that is lower Egypt. Okay, I should have a map slide here. That would make this less confusing. Google Egypt, look up a map, look at the river. Um, also, you'll notice the shape because it has that fan lake shape and stem kind of looks like a lotus flower, which is a motif that is used over and over again in ancient Egypt. Uh, Egyptian decor and artifacts and things. Okay, so anyway, uh, Narmir is very important because he's the one who unifies these. So in the pre-dynastic period, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt were separate. They were separate kingdoms, okay? And he unifies them. He doesn't, they love using unify in um, these historical texts. You may, may, you may remember from the uh, Fertile Crescent lecture, there was a lot of unifying happening. What does unifying actually mean? violently conquering and then combining, basically. So this depiction on the back of the palette on the left here is him um, killing his enemies and taking over to become the leader. So uh, prior to this takeover, um, the leader of Lower Egypt would wear uh, this hat that's shaped like Namir has in this, this larger um, image on the side that's this sort of conical shape. And then um, of Upper Egypt, they wore a hat that kind of went like this and had a little spiral. And then after they're unified, the hats also are unified. So if you look at this image of Narmir on the front of the palette in the upper uh, left-hand side, he's the tallest figure there. And you can see he has this thing that has sort of the conical piece and then the curly piece. So he has a combined, uh, combined crown showing the unification of upper and lower Egypt, okay? Um, so one of the things that's very exciting about this piece of, of art is that it is the earliest labeled piece of art. So it actually has Namir's name on it, um, showing that it was his, it was created for him and it depicts him, which is the first time we've seen this. So when you go into a museum and you're looking at things from say the Renaissance period, um, they have titles, right? So that you have the artist name and you have the title. Well, we don't have an artist name on this, but we do have a title. So we know it's Namir, we know it's Namir's palette. Okay, so that's pretty exciting. What's a palette, by the way? Um, who, who can think what that is? Usually a woman in class gets the right answer first. So when you hear the word palette, um, if you are someone who wears makeup, uh, regardless of gender, lots of people wear makeup, uh, the thing that comes to mind, and I'm one of those people, as you can see, the first thing that comes to my mind, well, the first thing is a painting palette because I'm a painter, but the second thing is an eyeshadow palette, right? Like you go to Sephora and you're picking out your eyeshadow. It comes in a usually rectangular thing that has all the different colors laid out. That's a palette, right? Yeah, people who wear eyeshadow, we know what I'm talking about. Okay, so um, oftentimes that's the first thing that the people come up with when I ask what's a palette. And they're absolutely right. This is King Nemer's makeup palette, okay? So um, you can see on, so the, the left-hand side is the back, the right-hand side is the front. You see this uh, area where these two creatures' necks get really long and curl around each other and make that indentation. That would have held his eyeshadow. So ancient Egyptians used coal and uh, lead, which caused some health problems, to blacken their eyes and create these beautiful kind of eye, early eyeliner looks on their eyes. So this was a very decorative, usually they were much more simple, but because he was a pharaoh, he had a very decorative, elaborative, elaborate kind of um, palette for his eyeshadow. So this was King Namir's eyeshadow palette. Okay. Um, and yes, this is the earliest labeled piece of art. Okay, now we're gonna do a little bit of vocabulary. So I mentioned this word uh, when we were talking about ziggurats, when I was talking about the Fertile Crescent in the Paleolithic lecture. So this is a mastaba. Um, a mastaba is a tomb in early Egypt, and it's a tomb that's kind of like one tier of a ziggurat. So it's shaped like this, as you can see in the image. And then I have this little cross section here so you can see there would have been a little chapel, a little offering table. Again, you make offerings, um, and that's to give things in the afterlife to the ka of your deceased uh, loved one or friend or whomever, because this is part of the belief system. 
um, and you would have a statue that the Ka lives in. So there's a little statuette for the Ka to live in. And then there's the shaft, and then there's the actual burial chamber is underneath this thing. So the body is down below, and the mastaba that you can see is the part where you go in to pay respects and bring offerings to the, to the um, dead person. Okay, an important figure uh, is Imhotep. So Imhotep was a master builder. Last night, when, or last night, last week, when we were talking about... Um, the Fertile Crescent, I may have mentioned, and if I didn't, I apologize, I should have mentioned Inhiduana. Inhiduana was um, a priestess who, uh, what, we have some of her notes and things and some of her poetry. She was also a poet. And she um, was a priestess to the goddess Inanna, or Ishtar, who we talked about last time. And Inhiduana is the first recorded name we have of a writer, um, of a, in her case, a poet. Um, but the first recorded name of someone who's an artist or artisan who's making things is Imhotep. And so this is an uh, image of an Imhotep. Um, and he was a master builder. He was an architect. Uh, and so he worked for King Dosher, D-J-O-S-E-R, and is quite important. So you'll notice this is our first slide where we have the artist's name preceding the title or the description of what it is because we know who designed this, who made it. So this is um, a uh, tomb designed by Imhotep, the master builder, and he designed it for uh, the pharaoh he worked for, who was Dozier. So this is Dozier's stepped pyramid, and it's in Saqqara, Egypt. Um, so this looks sort of familiar, right? This sort of design, the stepped pyramid, First of all, it first maybe th makes us think of a ziggurat, right? Like we looked at last time. They kind of look like this. It also sort of looks like if you've studied South American culture at all, uh, particularly the Aztecs, the Aztecs also had stepped pyramids, which is kind of amazing that these kind of similar things are happening on totally different sides of, of the world, right? I talked about that a little bit when we were looking at the Paleolithic and the hand stencils that people were doing. Um, in Australia and China and uh, Africa and Europe and South America. So we have a stepped pyramid happening in multiple places as well, in the Fertile Crescent in Egypt and over in South America. So this is designed by uh, Imhotep, and not only does it look like a ziggurat, it also sort of looks like our mastaba, but taking a mastaba, which is a tomb for like a regular person, right? Well, not a regular person, like a, a the tombs are expensive, so it's a it's a nice tomb, but we have one of these, and we're building something for a pharaoh, because you're Imhotep, and you're like, well, I'm the master builder, I want to make something grand for my pharaoh. The tombs were constructed while the pharaoh was still alive, by the way, so they could oversee how grand their uh, tomb would be for their ka, right? So this is an important thing to oversee. So you're Imhotep, you're trying to think of something kind of revolutionary, something fancier for your pharaoh, because he's your guy, you're the master builder, you want to have something that's um, respectful and, and honor, honors your king. So he thought of this stepped pyramid, and he, he was like, well, what if I took a bunch of mastabas and sat them on top of each other to make it more grand? So basically what this is, is several mastabas on top of each other to create this kind of shape. So that's where the shape comes from in Egyptian culture. Okay, um, so I also just wanted to give you kind of a layout of how this looked. So this is Dozier's um, tomb complex, burial complex overall. So Imhotep is not just a master builder, he is also a high priest of the sun god Re, R-E. And, uh, and remember, Edhiduana was a priestess of the god Inanna, right? So we have this, this kind of connection between these people that are creative types that we remember the names of, have this connection to the religion of their people, which again is kind of central to the, the city planning and things at this time. So that's, that's how part of how they get uh, rem remembered. The other piece of that is that in this culture and in a lot of early cultures at the time, artistic talent, whether you're a poet or an artist or a master builder or, or whatever, is considered a holy gift from God. So the fact that he had this ability to design and engineer and draw these, these incredible um, architectural achievements 
it was seen as he was a holy person. So that's part of why he's also a high priest, is that he's seen as, a, as someone favored by the gods with talent, okay? So, um, actually, after Imhotep dies, he gets an honor that is usually reserved only for pharaohs, and that's that after he dies, the Egyptians deify him. What does deify mean? It means they decide that he is a god. It's sort of like being sainted in a uh, Catholic tradition, but it's a little, it's like they believe you're an actual god, not just a saint. So um, pharaohs are considered holy, are considered deities after they die. And in Imhotep, who is this artist, is then deified, just to show you what a big deal he was at the time. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So we have Dozier's uh, Stepped Pyramid here, which is at Saqqara, and it's a necropolis. So it's it's a city of the dead. So there's there's other people buried here as well. And we have this whole structure that is um, built. So we have tombs of other people. This would be um, his queen um, and important people in his court, this kind of thing. But it's not just the Stepped Pyramid. It's this whole structure, okay? Um, and just to show you some of the other design elements here, this is the entrance to the mortuary precinct of Dozier. And I want you to look at these columns because these are uh, kind of an important development. And we see this exact kind of design. These are fluted columns, meaning they have these um, grooves carved into them. And we have this kind of lintel system set up like a temple. We see this design later when we're looking at the Greeks. Um, and we see this design all over the Middle East and all over uh, the Mediterranean Europe. So it's it's something that is is seen again. <clears throat> okay, let's go back for just a second and talk about the structure a little bit. So uh, it's a little bit hard to tell scale on these things sometimes, but those are people. If you look at the people standing in the corner there, you can see, uh, get a better idea of the scale. This thing is 200 feet tall. So this is huge and this is made in 2630 BC so making something this tall that early is kind of mind-boggling it's sort of a marvel um, and it again looks like mastabas stacked on top of each other which makes sense which reminds us of ziggurat um, the point of it being that large is one to protect the mummified king two to symbolize his power that he was very powerful in his life and he did good works in his life on earth so he then is uh, kind of deified afterwards to show that he is closer to the gods who are up high above so this is kind of reaching toward the heavens um, it's his home in the afterlife the home of his ka in the afterlife is in his, uh, his tomb um, and it also is this idea that that he's ascending right so it gives the idea of moving upward Okay, so back to these columns. These are the earliest uh, known columns. This is the earliest time that we see this, this kind of column. Um, they're not attached to the wall. They were standalone columns. The capitals um, in some of them, so the tops, not on these particular ones, but on some of the other fragmented columns that are found, um, look like plants, which were used in the Jubilee Festival. The Jubilee festival reaffirmed the existence in the afterlife. So this is an important rite that is done after someone dies. Um, and in the case of a pharaoh, it's done many years after they die every year to like reaffirm their um, continued existence in the afterlife. Okay, so when I ask at the beginning of this lecture, what do you know about Egypt? Usually one of the first things, if not the first thing, is pyramids. We really associate pyramids with Egypt, right? So these are the Great Pyramids. Let's find out why they're great. No, let's, uh, let's learn a little bit more about them. Um, so we have Minkare is the, the smallest of the three. We have these three smaller ones in front, but the, the smallest of the three, and my slide is reversed, Minkare is the one over there, um, is Minkare. Then we have Kafre is the one in the middle, and then we have Khufu is the one, uh, in this case, further to the left. So that should say from right a mirrored image in the way this is recording. So sorry about that. Um, the pyramid shape, the triangle shape, um, is something that's really important in the culture of Egypt, particularly at this time. So we're in Giza now. These are in Giza, Egypt. Um, and so the emblem of Heliopolis, 
is here and it's the seat of the cult of Ray. So I don't mean cult like you're in a cult, call your dad, you've been kidnapped and brainwashed. Um, cult in this case refers to a religious group. So um, within the greater religion where everybody, all the Egyptians believe in all these different gods and goddesses, there's particular groups who are devoted to one particular deity. Okay, and those groups are called the cult of whichever deity they're devoted to, the cult of Anubis, the cult of Osiris. So um, there's one group that's the cult of Ray. So this is the people who are worshiping Ray, who's the creator god, who's also the sun god, right? We talked about him a little bit earlier. So um, this uh, emblem of Heliopolis and Giza, this is the seat of the cult of Ray, okay? And their symbol, their emblem is a triangle, okay? And the uh, pyramidal stone, which is called uh, Bin Be, B E N, uh, or Bin Bin, B E N B E N, Bin Bin. So that symbol basically is a stand in for Ray, for the god Ray. So that's why this becomes a very important emblem. So the pyramids are not just. Um, designed this way as kind of a progression of the stepped pyramid that we saw before, which is a progression of the uh, Mustaba. They're also meant to be a symbol of Ray and a symbol of the god Ray and a symbol of the sun that exists in the sky that makes life possible. So it's a pretty loaded uh, symbol, this the pyramid. Um, part of the belief of this group is that the sun's rays are the ladder that the God King uses to ascend to heaven. So this idea that the rays coming off of the sun, which are kind of triangle-like, are what the Pharaoh, the God King, uses to climb up to heaven, to the sun. Okay, um, so this becomes a very important emblem uh, for the sun cult and for Egypt in general. Let's look at what these things look like on the inside, right? Um, so here's a plan of one of the Great Pyramids. So this is the internal arrangement of the Pyramid of Khufu. They're pretty similarly arranged. So we have our entrance, and then we have all these tricky bits, because they didn't want you to be able to immediately get to where the Pharaoh is, okay? So there's kind of these false chambers and these different kinds of passageways. Um, so the King's Chamber is over there. Uh, at 10, which you see there, and then buried in there with him would be uh, the queen. Okay, so we have the queen's chamber, which is usually below, I think in one of them it's kind of directly laterally uh, connected. There's ventilation shafts. That is uh, for air for the people building the thing, but it's also so the Ka can get out. So the Ka can go up and ascend and come back to its home and things like this. Um, there's antechambers and grand galleries that house a lot of the artifacts, a lot of the gold, all the things that you want to go with your ka into the afterlife, okay? So it's kind of interesting because even though it's this huge structure, there's not that much space inside. It's, it's largely solid, so there's not that much open space inside. Okay, let's look at the other thing that people tend to say pretty early on when I ask what you know about Egypt. Everybody says pyramids, and ev almost everybody also throws in the sphinx. Um, so it's thought that the Sphinx is actually um, a portrait of Khafre. Khafre was um, a pharaoh and was is the guy that's buried in one of the Great Pyramids, the one that is named for him, Khafre, right? Um, some people argue that it's actually Khufu, but it's thought that it's one of those two guys. Probably Khafre. It seems like there's more information, more archaeologists and scientists and people saying it's probably Khafre. Um, so one of the things I mentioned earlier is that the little there's often little statues inside tombs, and that is a place for the Ka to live, right? That's their kind of stand-in because the body's decaying, so you can't live there. So you have a little statue that won't decay. So uh, some people think that the Sphinx was kind of the statue uh, for the Ka of the, this pharaoh. Uh, Khafre or Khufu, whichever one it was, and was carved for his body to, for his, not his body, for his ka, for his soul to live in afterwards. Um, it's a misnomer. Sphinx is, is a uh, word that is not an Egyptian word. Um, 
it's uh, we'll talk about it later when we get to to Greece but it's it's been called this by people studying it later it was not the word for it at the time that it was uh, created right so uh, it's sandstone, it's in Giza, it's, you can see one of the Great Pyramids in the background, it's in the same location. Um, and so statues, the mortuary statues and the Sphinx itself, are quite stiff at this time. Also statues that are just like the portraits of the pharaohs at this time are very stiff. And they're stiff on purpose, that's, that's an intentional stylization. And the reason for that is to show that the... Um, Ka, that is the true essence of the pharaoh, of the person, is timeless and is not lifelike and moving and nimble. It's stiff and hard and lasts the, through the, the tests of time. So that's a very intentional kind of thing. So as an example of that, that isn't a giant uh, sphinx, let's look at this mortuary statue of Khafre. So this is from Giza. This is carved out of diorite, which is a, uh, it's sort of a granite-like material that is used a lot in Egypt. And you can see he's very stiff. He's seated. Um, he would have had a staff in his hand. He would have had an orb in the other hand that are, will probably gold and have since been uh, removed. But he's very stiff, right? He looks very unanimated. He's very stiff. And that's quite purposeful, okay? So that's, that's a very intentional style. We'll talk about that a little later when we get into some of the later stylistic changes. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Middle Kingdom. In the Middle Kingdom, um, Egypt is united and strengthened by Mentuhotep, so he's a pharaoh. Uh, and then we have Sinuskret II, who is um, portrayed in kind of un unprecedented uh, realism. So we have this kind of softness in the way that he is portrayed, which is very different when we look back and see how stiff we have Khafre, um, who's from one of the early dynasties portrayed. So the Middle Kingdom, we have this um, sort of a little bit of a return to, to realism happening. Um, we have facial expressions on our, our pharaohs and deities being portrayed. Um, and they're not quite as stiffened and impassive, which is a pretty big shift. It's a pretty big change. Um, we also have different kinds of tombs. So it's not just pyramids all the time in Egypt. Um, there's lots of different kinds of tombs, just like in any culture, you see that architectural trends uh, change, right? So these are the rock-cut tombs of Beni Hassan. Beni Hassan is the, the region, not the name of a particular person. This is in Egypt. And these are cut directly into the rock, as the name implies. And so they're dug directly out of the cliffs. And one of the things about this is they are very well preserved because they're inside the actual cliffs and everything was cut out of it. So that they're cut out of solid stone, right? Um, and we have these beautiful frescoes inside. So uh, I thought I had a closer up image of this, but the, a fresco is a mural that's painted on the wall. So we have these extremely nicely preserved frescoes here. Um, we have uh, a, a lot of things going on um, that are well preserved and we learn a lot about uh, the culture from this. these spaces. You see a repeat of the, the same style of columns that we had at Dozier's temple. And then we get into the New Kingdom. So before we get here, we have uh, Hykos, H-Y-K-S-O-S, -S, who's from Mesopotamia and uh, Syria, comes and conquers Egypt. We have Amos I, who then conquers Hyksos uh, back. And then we have uh, the arrival of the New Kingdom. So there's a lot of conquering back and forth and fighting that happens, and that's what divides time. So kind of the things that we know about that distinguish the New Kingdom, um, uh, well, all the different kingdoms. Okay, so the Old Kingdom, the big thing is the pyramids, right? That's what we associate with the Old Kingdom. The New Kingdom, the big shift is to these grand temples, okay? So we have our... Uh, Kingdom, our old kingdom, we have these beautiful pyramids, we get into our middle kingdom, and we have the more subtle kind of rock cut tombs, and then we get into the new kingdom, and we have these very grand temples. 
And here's where um, the royals are worshiping gods and then uh, in these temples, so they're, they're a place to go to worship, specifically the gods, so they're not tombs like the previous, I mean, they're not just tombs like the previous, uh, the pyramids and the mastabas. These are places that are like what we think of a temple or church today where people would go and worship their gods there, but then the royals are buried there themselves. So they are a place of worship and then they're a place where the pharaoh and the pharaoh's family are buried and then are, are worshipped along with the gods. Okay, so um, this is Dira el uh, Bari. This is um, a very important location. Uh, as it is the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, which is one of the most um, important sites in Egyptian history and the most emblematic of this period. So um, Hatshepsut is a super interesting figure and one of my favorite historical figures. So um, she's a woman and she uh, was the regent. So her father dies and she's the regent, which is someone who's sort of ruling in someone's stead until the person who's actually supposed to rule is of age, okay? But then she claimed after her father's death, when she's just supposed to be the regent until a male heir can take over, she claims to the public that her father uh, crowned her king she then commissions, because queen wasn't uh, the same title, so a queen wasn't a ruler. So she doesn't say she was crowned queen. She says she was crowned pharaoh. She was crowned king, specifically, by her father. And then she commissions a um, relief carving, a big mural, of her being crowned by her father in front of all the gods. So the gods she witnessed this... Uh, this coronation of her as the new pharaoh. And so it makes it very difficult for people to argue that she should not be the pharaoh because she is saying, well, I was appointed not just by your last pharaoh, who was my dad, I was also appointed and approved by all the gods. So you can take it up with the gods if you don't think I should be your ruler, which it's very difficult to argue with that, right? So she was pretty smart, she's a pretty crafty person. Um, her architect is Sinan Mutt, who is um, very important. We know his name. So he, he designs this kind of um, temple complex. Uh, his name is S-E-N-E-N-M-U-T, Sinan Mutt. Uh, within this complex, we have, sh we have multiple shrines. So we don't just have one god um, being worshipped here that's associated with her. She has many gods to kind of fortify her position. So she has um, Amen or Re, the sun god. She has Hathor, who's the um, mother goddess, the cow, remember. She has Anubis, the god of death. Um, and then buried here, she buries her father, who's Thutmose uh, one, the first, T-H-U-T-M-O-S-E, one, that's her dad. And then she is eventually buried here as well. Um, she's the first great female monarch in history. So she's a, a really important um, historical figure and kind of a fascinating figure. For a long time, um, she, archaeologists and historians didn't know she was a woman because uh, she has herself recorded as, uh, portrayed as a male in her portraits a lot. Um, so she rules as pharaoh for 20 years. That's a pretty long time. That's a long reign for someone um, in this time period. Um, and she's the first great female monarch whose name is recorded, and it's recorded a lot, and it's recorded a lot because she commissioned a lot of artwork. So she's someone who understood the power of cultural um, credit, essentially. So she has all these murals and all these statues and things commissioned of herself, so her likeness is all over the place, her name is all over everything, so people associate this greatness, this wealth, all this art, all this um, incredible architecture with her. So her name becomes um, affiliated with this. She's portrayed as a sphinx, a sphinx a lot. She has many uh, smaller sphinx sculptures of herself. She's often portrayed with the pharaoh's beard, um, which again is a little bit confusing, but um, she was taking that iconography of the pharaoh and applying it to herself to further fortify her rule. She claimed to not just be the daughter of the king of Thutmose, but she says that she was actually the daughter 
of Re, of Amen, the uh, sun god, the creator god. So she made all kinds of claims and sold them pretty well to her constituents. So here's some closer images of her, um, the, some of the artwork at the complex. So we see the mural and some sculptures at her, um, at her temple. Okay, um, let's go to Abu Simbel. So this is uh, a important site also for uh, the New Kingdom. So I said Hatshepsut ruled for 20 years, which is a pretty long span for a pharaoh, which is true. This guy blows her reign away. This is Ramses II, and he ruled for 60 years, which is crazy. People didn't live for 60 years back then, hardly ever. So he was kind of a badass. He held on to power for a really long time. Very unusual. Um, he's known as the warrior pharaoh. He's kind of often called the last great warrior pharaoh. He was a conqueror. He was uh, very proficient in battle. He was also a great strategist. And so this is interesting because um, he, for his tomb, instead of having some portrayals of gods leading into it or anything, this looks like four different figures. It's four portrayals of himself. So he had himself carved in these colossal forms four times uh, leading in. So um, it's kind of rad. It's very, uh, we'll say, assertive. A little bit narcissistic, but you know, he's a pharaoh. He thinks that he's ordained by God. So that's sort of comes with the, the um, territory. His principal wife was uh, Nefertari. Um, and she is also buried here with him. So we see this kind of monumental architecture. And this has some connections back to the rock tombs, right? So this is carved into the rock, but it has this very grand entrance. It has this very grand kind of feeling. And when we go inside, it's as grand inside. So this is all carved in. Every surface is covered um, with relief carving and was painted. It would have been very vibrantly painted uh, when it was first created. Lots of hieroglyphics. We have all these depictions of Ramses II. Okay, so now we're going to go to Karnak. This is another really important site. So here we have uh, the Temple of Amun-Re. Um, which, again, is the sun god, the creator god, very important. So this is built by a bunch of different people. So uh, Thutmus I, Hatshepsut's dad, starts this. Then Hatshepsut has her guy, um, uh, Sinsenmut, come and, and work on it as well. Then Ramses II contributes as well and works on building this thing. And then Thutmus III, who is uh, Hatshepsut's... Um, nephew, I think. I'm trying to remember. He's related in some way. Anyway, all of these pharaohs contribute to the construction of this thing. It was huge. It was this massive complex that was supposed to be kind of the grandest temple uh, constructed. So they all um, contribute to this, and it's a temple to worship the sun god, but it also has a necropolis or a, a burial complex where important people in society are buried here. Important members of royalty are buried here. There's places to make offerings. There's all these kind of um, important aspects of, of worship and of um, aspects of the afterlife being celebrated and um, commissioned in this place. So here are some images. It has these monumental columns um, and, and rows and rows of columns that have the top that kind of look like a lotus flower. I mentioned a lotus flower earlier as being sort of like the shape of the delta of the Nile. So this is a motif we see a lot. We have many sphinx like uh, lion figures. We have um, lots of pharaohs being portrayed. We have this is all covered in uh, carved relief hieroglyphics that would have been brightly painted. Um, and what we call this, so this is inside the temple of Amun-Re at Karnak, uh, this is called a hippostyle, so H-Y-P-O-S-T-Y-L-E, and what that means is it's a colonnade, it's a bunch of columns that hold up the roof of a structure. So this is an important development, this is the first time we've seen something like this. Um, so it's a hall in which 
columns support the roof, basically. But the, you can see by the people, this is an extremely grand scale here, right? Um, okay, so here uh, we're going to jump over to Thebes, Egypt, and go into this tomb. So this is the tomb of uh, Nebamun. He was um, a scribe, so he was kind of an important guy in society. He was also um, a counter of grain, which is sort of like an accountant. So he was kind of a, a scribe accountant type person. He was a record keeper. He was very important in um, Thebes and society at the time. So he has this very, he has this very nice, nicely appointed tomb. Okay. Um, which was totally taken apart by British archaeologists in this piece of the wall of his tomb now exists in the British Museum in London. I've seen it. It's pretty incredible when you think about how long ago this was painted and it's still so vibrant. Um, it's the best preserved paintings from this time period are in this tomb. They're very well preserved. They were in this tomb. Now they're in the British Museum, but you get the point. You can uh, see them. They were done in a technique called fresco secco. Uh, if you take Art History 2 with me, we'll talk about fresco secco versus fresco buono. Fresco secco is dry uh, fresco, uh, whereas fresco buono is true uh, fresco or um, wet fresco. So fresco is, is painting on plaster. It's a mural painted on plaster on the wall. If it's secco or dry, it's painted on the dry finished wall. If it's buono or wet, it's painted while the plaster is still wet, so it becomes one with the wall. So this is dry, a uh, dry fresco. Um, and here we can see this is a depiction of um, fowling, fowling meaning hunting birds, uh, hunting with birds. So he has his uh, hawk here that is helping him hunt. He is uh, going after these different kinds of fowl, different kinds of birds. You can see the depiction of the fish down below. It's very lovely. We have our lotus flowers, which that motif again is kind of seen uh, a lot in Egypt. Okay, the last period we're going to talk about before we go into the kingdom of Kush is uh, the Akhenaten and Amarna period. Um, so we're going to look at this image behind a, a little more, but just to introduce you to this period, there's a huge change at this time. So there's a huge change in religion. So um, Aton is the uh, is represented by the sun disk, okay, and uh, this uh, the pharaoh decides that this is the only god. There's one god now. It's Aton. He's the sun. He's represented by the sun disk. He's the creator. He's the god of the afterlife. He's it. That's one god now. Not all this many gods thing. So that's a gigantic change, right? That's a huge shift. Um, and there's also lots of artistic and cultural changes as well. So um, basically, Akhenaten wants to completely shift culture. And he wants it to be a very drastic kind of shift that reflects this big change in religion and reflects his rule. So uh, everything is stylized very differently. Um, so one of the things that's the most notable change is remember all the very stiff portrayals we saw before? Um, that shifts completely. So we have this very soft kind of feminine kind of curvilinear more sort of humanized kind of depiction um, of of human bodies, basically. So this is a portrait of the pharaoh of Akhenaten. Uh, it's from the Temple of Aten at Karnak, Egypt. And you can see that he has hips and he has a little bit of a paunch, he has a little bit of a belly, and he has a little bit softer features. He has these very kind of voluptuous uh, lips. So it's this very like flowy, soft kind of body. Uh, not like the very, very stiff sort of portrayals of pharaohs um, before. And here, just to give a comparison, this is a, one of the many, many sculptures of Ramses II. We know he loves sculptures of himself. So you can see the difference in the portrayals here. So we have this, this very um, stiff Ramses II. He is a warrior. He is standing tall. He has a flat stomach. He has big shoulders. He has big muscles. He has no voluptuous lips. He's very stiff. And then we have this kind of flowy, beautiful, soft kind of portrayal of Akhenaten. So a very big shift culturally in how um, things are portrayed. Uh, so Akhenaten's name may not be familiar to you, but his wife probably is. Uh, Nefertiti is quite famous. So his queen, his wife, was Nefertiti. Her name means the beautiful one has come.
what a great name, right? Your name just announces you as this beautiful presence coming into a room every time you come in. Fertiti, the beautiful one has come. Um, this is a sculpture of her that is incomplete, but it was done by Thutmose. Now that name sounds familiar because that is the same name as Habsput's dad and her nephew who succeeds Ramses, but this is a different guy, no relation, totally different guy. So he's an artist, so this is a time um, again, when we have an artist that is so famous, we know his name. So this is this we see this more frequently as we go forward in history, but we know the name of the artist who made this. Um, and uh, Nefertiti, there's a lot of mythos around her. She's considered this very uh, this great beauty. She was also a great counselor of her husband and and um, their uh, marriage and relationship is something that uh, is sort of a a legend, legendary kind of thing. Um, we also have a lot of sculptures of this woman. This is Tai. So she is uh, Akhenaten's mother, and she was also one of his great advisors, great counselors, and we see many portrayals of her. And one of the things that's interesting about both of these is they're a little more realistic. They're a little more naturalistic, right? They're also softer. They don't have quite the the super harsh sort of uniform features that many of our sculptures before. We can tell the difference between them. You can tell these are two different women. They have different shaped noses and mouths. They have different shaped eyes. So you can tell these are two distinct women, even though they're made at the same time, probably by the same artist. Though this one is not signed, so we don't know for sure that it's that must. Um, they both appear in lots of art from this time. So they're, they're very, um, they're kind of community favorites as well. They're portrayed quite a lot. Uh, we also start seeing the Ankh, which is a kind of famous symbol we associate with the Egyptians. That starts being, um, that comes about in this time, and that's a symbol of life. This is kind of a sweet family portrait, okay? So this is Akhenaten, his queen Nefertiti, and their three daughters. And um, they're all portrayed together. Um, you notice the proportions of the children are kind of weird. It's very, very stylized. We also notice that we have um, up above the sun disk, right? Because we're all worshiping one God now. And so that is a ton and that is symbolized by the, the sun disk. And we have all the rays of the sun coming out and sort of touching or blessing this royal family we um, see the sort of curvilinear portrayal of them. They're not quite as stiff as we're used to seeing in um, relief sculptures. So we have this sunken relief um, showing their family together. Okay, so I am going to stop there. Um, one of you is writing about Tutankhamun, so King Tut, which uh, he was actually a very unimportant historically ruler, but he's kind of important in terms of uh, his tomb when it was discovered became sort of all the rage and everybody got into Egyptology all of a sudden. So one of you is writing about King Tut. I, I often get asked, like, what about King Tut? What about Cleopatra? Don't worry, you uh, will hear about them in the discussion board. Um, so the next lecture will be about the Kingdom of Kush and the relationship between the Kingdom of Kush and Egypt, which is very significant and important, and then the culture and artifacts of the Kingdom of Kush as well. Sorry, this went a little longer than I meant for it to, but all right, I will see you next time. Thanks.